What's up, guys? I am Will Grant, and welcome to another episode of Chat with Will Grant. We got our co-host here, Dr. Edwin Adams, and we're going to be talking about all things nutrition. I know nutrition tends to be one of the most confusing subjects to most, one of the most difficult subjects. Um, just learning how to overcome temptation, learning how to be above our cravings, and as well as um, just understanding what is good, healthy food and what is food that is just marketed well. So I'm very excited to be um, diving in deep in this conversation. And if you guys have any questions throughout this whole process, um, make sure to leave it in the comments below. And we are doing a live recording. And to join in on these live conversations, don't forget, you can go to chatwithwillgrant.com. And we are doing this every single week. Uh, but if you're over there watching on YouTube, Again, put all of your questions, comments, and concerns in the comment box up below, and it's something that we're going to make sure that we go over. So without further ado, how are you doing, Edwin? Hey, fantastic, man. Happy Thor's Day. You know, it's my favorite day of the week, and I'm glad to be able to speak with you, Will. Yeah, man. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here, and I'm super grateful for every single person who logs in and every single person who joins in on these conversations because we're all learning and growing together, and you know, this is one of the best feelings to not only um, find progress in my own life, but to help other people find progress in their own lives. Because, you know, like I say all the time, the stronger we are as individuals, the stronger we can be as a species and as a planet. And it's really up to us at this point. I think we're at a pivotal point in society. I think we're at a pivotal point in um, not only the ecosystem and the world and, you know, the social economics as well. But um, I, I think what we do and how we live day to day is truly a determining factor of um, what our next generation and what our kids and what kind of world that they're going to inherit. Um, so it's about more than just us. <laughs> yeah, it's always about something bigger than we are, Will. So thank you for saying that. Um, we have some people returning to the webinar. It's always good to see Braden and, and David and David here. And I know there, there'll be more that are joining us. So uh, for, for those who continue to communicate with us between these webinars, it's really humbling and, and touching to read about your stories, read about your struggles and, and offer you some you know, steps forward that you can take because it's always action that is going to be the answer to the problems that you seek answers to. So thank you for continuing to ask questions and being insatiably curious about these topics that we discuss and that we're very passionate about. Will, we've been talking, this is our the start of our third webinar on nutrition. And I, I, I pose to you that let's go over the obstacles because as Ryan Holiday would say, the obstacle is the way. And we've only gotten obstacle number five related to really cravings and, and the bad habits that we have. But I've I've still got probably 13 more obstacles we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. Those first two episodes went pretty deep, you know. So if you've missed those first two episodes, we went over um, what are the top four obstacles um, putting in most of our way with leads a lot of them into temptation, into cravings, into just not being able to control ourselves when there are which always is good food that is bad food around. So yeah, um, if you haven't seen those previous two episodes and you're wanting to even um, dive deeper into a nutrition, maybe check those out. And then uh, without keep going on, on a crazy rant, let's get right into number five and let's start working through these things. Yeah, let's do that. Will, where can they find the first two episodes in case they are finding you for the first time? Yeah, just over on YouTube, uh, we actually have a whole playlist, Chat with Will Grant. I believe this is episode 23 or 24 at this point. Um, so yeah, we have action and information packed episodes all the way from episode one, where we're going over breathing, nutrition, fasting, movement, um, pretty much all things to live a happy, healthy, and strong life. Um, and like Edwin said, the past three episodes have been really diving deep into nutrition. This is Jada, the one that's always barking and making noise in the way. <laughs> Jada wants to be uh, on stage too. She's always welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's a star. She knows it. All right. So, Will, here is the number six most frequent obstacle to eating as your best self. So, guess what it is? I, you've got you've got to guess. Um. You have, I'll say this, you have one of these, but you don't exercise it very frequently. 
I don't know, man. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> it is the sweet tooth. So we've alluded to it in snacking and cravings a little bit, but really it's its own um, pillar or obstacle for a lot of people is just this, uh, well, it's a craving. It's a sweet tooth. And do you know where the term sweet tooth comes from, Will? Tell me. I'm just full of useless information today on a Thursday, but it actually it comes. Sound, it sounds very useful. Let's hear it. Well, it comes from a word we've been using since the 14th century. Uh, well, we've been using sweet tooth since the 14th century, but it actually originates with the word toothsome, which was actually a word used to describe something delicious. So somehow we have now converted toothsome into sweet tooth to describe a particular aspect of food group that we have an irrational relationship with. So yeah. Will, I know you have spoken in the past that it's okay to have a sweet tooth and, and it kind of brings in the mantra of everything in moderation, but let's, let's dive a little deeper about the sweet tooth and why it seems to be such a big barrier for people. Yeah. I mean, we all have it, you know, it's built in you know, our DNA, we've evolved over so many years of wanting that sugar, of wanting that high calorie sweet tooth, you know, and it's funny, I thought they would call a sweet tooth because the sugar rots your teeth. And I would guess as a sweet tooth is something that, um, or a sweet tooth is a rotten tooth. But, but yeah, I mean, it's something we all have, you know, and we all have to deal with, you know, I, I don't know too many people who don't have a sweet tooth. But I think, like Edwin said, it's about moderation. You know, it's okay to indulge sometimes, but I think it's when it becomes um, something that's controlling your life instead of you being in control of when it needs to take some serious action. Um, I, I, I know it becomes really difficult when you start bringing these sweet things into your house. You know, like when I talk to people with kids, they have the hardest time eating good food because their kids are eating, you know, really high sugary dense foods, which like, that's a big problem in, in itself. If you don't want to be eating that food, you don't really want to be giving it to your kids anyways, you know, because you're literally developing an addiction in your kids. If you're, if they feel like they need that sugar at, every day and a lot of what i touched on like the previous episode it's just coming down to an addiction pretty much all of us are addicted to sugar and just wanting that quick dopamine fix you know so you know i'm I, i'm not saying to never have anything sweet you know it's nice to enjoy some sweet th things especially if it's coming around thanksgiving but there's just better ways to do it you know like just getting organic cookies over regular cookies can be um an awesome step right there. But even if you're having organic cookies after every meal or every couple hours, it's not going to be good either. But just uh, going that extra step to have an organic choice is just always going to be a little bit better. And when you, you know, another little trick like I'm bringing up all the time is fasting. You know, fasting is an amazing tool that we could all use that is all free, that literally not only strengthens our ability to not be. Um, I guess, overwhelmed by cravings, but it actually can be sort of a repentance. So what I mean is if there is an evening where you just lost all control in, in indulgence and had a bunch of bad food, fasting is one of the best things to maybe do the next morning if it's just, you know, 12 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours, or even a 24 hour fast, your body does really good at just cleaning all of that out. They say about a 24 hour fast can clean up to a whole year's worth of bad food and toxins that you take in. So it's okay to indulge, just maybe use that fasting tool a little bit more. And like I said in the previous episode, if sugar is something that you're just completely addicted to and it's something that you need all the time and you are holding a lot of extra weight and having a lot more health issues, I would recommend maybe going cold turkey and just going a week without it, going two weeks without it. Because one thing I've learned about anything sweet or anything addictive, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, you know, a cigarette, a pill or bad food, that the more you have it, the more you need it, you know, the more you have it, the more you want it, the more you want it, the more you need it. So every time that you have that craving, and you overcome that craving, um, you strengthen your body and mind's ability to overcome it next time. 
Um, and that's why fasting is so powerful because you're overcoming that temptation the whole time almost because you may be hungry and you're changing your relationship with hunger. You're changing your relationship with temptation instead of something that is beating you or that you're battling with. It's almost like a resistance to gain you strength in the same way as going to the gym getting under a bunch of weight to squat, putting that weight on your shoulders brings that a resistance to strengthen your legs, strengthen your knees, strengthen your hips, strengthen your joints and your ligaments. Fasting does the same thing for your mental strength as well and your ability to overcome temptations. So if tempting is your number one problem, try fasting. You know, if, you know, if you've never fasted or before, start experimenting with 12 hours, which is not difficult in any way. Um, that's if you have dinner at 8 PM, that's just not snacking right before bed, you know? And honestly, if you can't help yourself and you have to snack right before bed, that's a serious problem. Like that is something that you must put out on the table to become aware of, to overcome that. And, and, and then you will have so much more strength and stability in your life and all other areas as well. So, like I said, if you have your last meal at 8 PM, Waiting till 8 a.m. is not difficult. And every hour that you push it past that, if it's 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11, or maybe even one or two o'clock in the afternoon, that whole time of that feeling hunger, of that overcoming those cravings, you're building mental strength and your body is using all of its resources on healing, repairing, detoxifying, and digesting. Your body does most of its most incredible work on an empty stomach. When, when your body is constantly digesting food, you know how they told you to have six to eight meals a day, which is a complete crock. But when you're having six to eight meals a day, most of your body's resources are always working on digestion. And when you're digesting, you're going to feel a little bit tired. You're not going to feel mentally sharp. Your body is always working on that. So then it only has that six to eight hours of sleep to do any of its repair. But if you push your eating window to four or five hours a day to where you have all of your calories in that four or five hours, you're able to use that other 19, 20 hours on healing, on repairing, on detoxifying. That's when all of your resources, we have all of these tiny little microorganisms that are constantly working for our health all day. And when those enzymes and resources aren't being worked on digestion, they redirect their focus and attention and energy towards healing and repairing. And that's, what's going to make us feel really good. And the more that we go with fasting, we're actually training our body to burn fat as energy, instead of constantly burning the carbohydrates and sugar that we're always eating. And coming from experience, when your body gets really good at burning fat as energy, one, you hold fat off so much better. And two, you are so much more mentally sharp because your brain prefers fat for energy much over much more than sugar or carbohydrates. So your brain will actually be firing really feels like on all cylinders and you'll just be so much more mentally sharp, mentally ready, and you won't be bogged down by cravings all day. Some great points, Will. Uh, two others I would throw in on there and, and we've alluded to these a little bit before, but the first would be the distance between you and, and the suite. Um, the, the larger that distance, the less likely you are to consume it. And the second strategy I would suggest is, uh, we've alluded to this, habit stacking. So associate then the, the consuming of a sweet with something you've done before, either workout and you can go have a little sweet portion control or um, make it as part of a whole meal that is well balanced and you can add on a little sweet. And that's the only time you can add it on is when it's part of a good habit. What do you say about that, Will? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that's a great idea. Also, another thing is nature gives us sweets. You know, a lot of our sweet tooths are already just blown out because we're having so much sugary foods that are just so bad for us. But nature gives us some really awesome sweets. I highly recommend every single person just planting a fruit tree in their yard. You know, planting a fruit tree in their yard will give you seasonal fruits that are not only sweet and delicious, but that will actually nourish you and nourish your family and nourish your friends and 
check this out, nourish the environment. Well, actually nourish your local ecosystem and your local community because every tree planted actually builds soil and takes a little bit carbon out of the atmosphere and gives you a little bit more fresher oxygen. You know, so plant, plant a fruit tree, plant a couple fruit trees so there's uh, fruiting at different times and then you'll constantly have something nice and sweet. Good point. Will, the next, next one is something I think we are all struggling with right now um, in an effort to support our local businesses. A lot of us are eating out more frequently than we've ever eaten out before. And a lot of us are tired of cooking. Um, so eating out frequently is the number seven biggest obstacle that people are facing today. What, what would be your commentary there? <laughs> Well, eating out is tough because I travel a lot. I'm always on the go. I'm always on the run. And it becomes almost impossible to not eat out sometimes. But just bringing to awareness again, we must know that almost all the time that we eat out, we're getting low quality food for top shelf prices, right? You know, and that's what most restaurants do is they try to source the cheapest vegetables. They try to source the cheapest meats. They try to source the cheapest breads and the lowest quality so they can make the most profit. And it, it, it doesn't even do well for flavor. That's why they have to add sugar and sauces and, you know, all these crazy seasonings and, you know, and butter to even make it taste good. You know, there are some, you know, if you have a lot of money, there's some really, really high quality restaurants, like the top, top restaurants, they actually know that the quality of how the food is grown um, affects not only the nutrients that the food has, but will actually affect the flavor. So a lot of the actual top, top, most expensive restaurants, they're going to their local farmers and they're sourcing the happiest, healthiest animals because they know they taste better. They know they're uh, higher in nutrients and they're getting the best vegetables and you know the best eggs and the best nutrients so to cook the best food, but most likely if, if, if it's not a five-star restaurant or if it's not a restaurant that is advertising, promoting that they're eating local, no antibiotics, um, taking the extra step for quality, you're getting low quality stuff. And the best thing that you could do is go to your local farmer, connect to your local farmer, just like those top chefs, just like those top restaurants, they're doing it for a reason, you know, and it really doesn't cost that much more to join a CSA, you know, a CSA being a community supported ag agriculture. That is how you get food from your local organic farmer. That is the best place to get your food. And it's a voting process as well. You're voting what you want more of. You're letting that organic farmer be able to expand his resources to be able to offer you better um, and more of a variety of food as well. So I'm not saying to never go out and eat, just try, you know, if, if, if money is not a thing to you, get the good stuff. You know, if you do go out to eat, make it worth it and go to that five-star restaurant and, and, and get the high quality stuff. But if you're just shooting for convenience, you know, and you're just wanting something quick and delicious, like you're going to pay the price for that, you know? And like I said, I'm not saying that you can never do it because I do it sometimes. So for example, I, I was at a race at weekend in kind of a rural town where there was no restaurants that had anything without antibiotics. You know, there was no restaurants that had anything without chemicals and, you know, I just did my best to get the best foods that they did have. And then when I got back, I did a little fast on Monday morning. You know, I woke up that morning and I, I had some apple cider vinegar and I had some, you know, Himalayan sea salt and uh, some lemon. You know, you know, I started my day with just turning on my digestion to help start cleaning that out. And I did a little fast, you know, and, and yeah, you know, I really think at this day and age, it's kind of the best that we can do. But the good thing is the more that we see that restaurant that says no antibiotics, no pesticides, and we do decide to go there, that's telling the industry what, that we want more high quality stuff. And I think that's becoming very apparent when you go to the restaurants, or not the restaurants, but when you go to the grocery stores, you're seeing a much 
more variety of selection, a much, uh, a, a much greater option of the higher quality organic foods because they're paying attention. You know, one thing that they do pay attention is they pay attention to where we're spending our money. Um, and the more we spend our money on the high quality stuff, it's going to bring that price down. It's going to um, make it more available. It's going to make it more accessible, you know, and I think that's what we can focus on is only doing the best we can. You know, there's going to be times where there's no other options. We have to eat, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you can always fast, <laughs> you know, fasting is always the best option, but you know, if not, just do the best you can and move on. Yeah. And remember you have a choice that, that in, uh, go into Wendy's or go into a restaurant that might source food appropriately, do your homework. Uh, don't fall prey to satisfying the hunger and let that, that over, um, overtake your ability to make good choices. So Hold on, but like a lot of time it, it, you, you don't really even have to do the research of what restaurants are good and bad, you know, because I promise you if a restaurant is paying the extra price for the chicken without antibiotics, you know, for the chicken without hormones, if they're paying the extra price for organic vegetables, they're going to tell you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's going to be on the walls. It's going to be on the menus. It, like they're going to be proud of that. Right. You know, unless you're at a five-star restaurant, then they probably won't tell you because they're just doing it because they're searching the highest quality foods. Yep. Fair enough. All right. Well, on to the next one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a point that we get past three today at least. So here's the next one. Speaking of eating out, how have portion sizes increased over the past decade? <laughs> I mean, I think we all like the more food that we eat, the more money the industry makes. Okay. You know, and the meat industry, the cattle industry, the milk industry, the grain industry, their goal is for us to consume as much as possible. And they have a lot of money in lobbying, you know, a, a lot of money in lobbying. That's why I remember, you know, I still cannot believe it till today, but I don't know why. But when I was a kid, we had that food pyramid that is literally the complete opposite of the way you want to eat for optimal health. That food pyramid showed to eat a bunch of grains, a bunch of meat and a bunch of dairy, which is the quickest way to heart disease and, you know, and diabetes and you know, the quickest way to being a complete victim and needing so many medications. But that, that's why, and those portion sizes are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. One of my favorite things to do when I do go out to eat is to only eat half of it you know, or only eat some of it. So then I get to enjoy the rest of it for leftovers the next day, you know, but honestly, the best thing that you can do is eat half of it and then give the other half to the homeless guy begging for food at the light, you know, give it away. But you know, the best thing that you can do is, is just eat less, the less that you eat, the, you know, the longer you're going to live and the healthier you're going to be. Yeah. It's amazing just how many meals you can make out of out of one take-home plate these days. My wife and I were splitting meals. You know, when we'd go out, we'd order one entree and split it between two plates, but still the volume of food is is incredible. So what we've done now is ask for the take-home plate when the food is delivered to the table. We go ahead and take the large percentage of it and go ahead and put it away so it's no longer on the plate. And then we can kind of enjoy the smaller portion together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's an interesting topic because I know like we were ingrained, you know, I'm sure you were too, to finish all the food on your plate, to finish all the food on your plate. And the portion sizes are just getting more and more. It's getting us fatter. It's getting us sicker. It's getting us more and more issues. So just be aware, like it takes 15 minutes for your brain or for your gut to tell your brain that you're full. So eat slow, chew, as slow as you possibly can and take your time eating, you know, and this is something that I have to work on constantly myself because I've naturally just a, a fast eater where I'm gulping down all of the food, but the slower we eat, the less that we'll eat. And that's the better we're going to feel. Chewing is the first form of digestion. So the more that you can chew your food, the better your food is going to digest and the better it's going to be for you. You know, I read about how the monks, they take so much time, how they 
take one tiny little spoonful or they put it in their mouth and they put their fork down and they try to chew it for as long as they possibly can until there's absolutely nothing. And throughout that whole time, they're practicing gratefulness. You know, they're practicing just eating and doing everything as slow and as best as they can. And that's really the best way to eat. So Will, you mentioned um, moving on to the ninth obstacle. Um, so that was large portions. Number nine, you alluded to in, in, in this day and age, our time seems to be so compressed. People have issues with time to prepare meals. So I know that's an excuse most of the time, but meal prep seems daunting, particularly if you like to eat fresh food versus, you know, eat five days of chicken and rice. Most people have a bad association of meal prep with quality. Uh, tell us, tell us about meal prep. I, I know you've been all over the board with that. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're an athlete, you almost have to meal prep. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, if you're an athlete, you almost have to meal prep, but if you're not an athlete, you don't really need to eat a bunch of meals a day. You know, like one meal a day and some snacks and you'll probably feel way better, you know, and I know that can sound so crazy to most because they're used to waking up and needing that breakfast right away. But the more you practice pushing that breakfast and pushing that first meal, the less you're going to need it. Um, and there's something else I wanted to mention on that. It, it kind of just slipped my mind. Um, well, I know that's a controversial topic, you, you know, um, just as there are carnivore diet advocates and then there are the keto advocates and then there's everybody else advocates, the, the differential out there on eating breakfast to supercharge your day versus fast to supercharge your day, there's got to be fair balance in there somewhere, right? Or, or I'm finding the literature seems to lean a little bit toward fasting, but not compelling enough. What do you think? I mean, I, I think to wake up and have breakfast first thing in the morning won't help you in any way, you know, unless, uh, un unless you're an athlete, you know, like unless you're an athlete and you have to fuel some gnarly physical endeavor you know, where you're trying to gain muscle, where you're trying to build strength, where you're trying to build an, like a race car, build an engine, you, you know, unless you're trying to do that, you don't need breakfast. You know, that is telling you that you need breakfast because it's marketing. You, they want you to consume as much as possible. So they want you to start as soon as you wake up, you know, but if you start your day to start consuming that's setting the tone for your day to then, then you have to consume lunch, then you have to consume dinner, then you have to consume snacks. And the more you consume, your resources are going to be working on digestion instead of that mental performance. But your brain will work better on an empty stomach, you know, maybe not the first three or four days. You know, if you've woken up and had breakfast for 20 years or for 20 plus years, and you wake up one morning and you don't have breakfast, everything in you, that addiction is going to be like, whoa, I'm starving. I'm hungry. You know, it's going to seem crazy to go past nine, 10 o'clock or without food because your body's just not used to it. You, you, your body's ability to start transferring that energy source towards fat is kind of weak, you know, like it's not as strong yet, but after three or four days, it's going to be easier just to keep pushing that that first meal a little bit further. And then your brain starts really working really working because it's just like it's built in, in our DNA to crave sugar and to want these high calorie foods. It's also built in us that when we are hungry, we have to really mentally perform because back in the day, back in from our ancestors, when we didn't have food, that's when we really had to figure something out. You know, that's when we had to really get creative. That's when we really had to ha have that extra motivation and that extra willpower because we had to find food, not only for us, but for our family. But now we don't have those issues, but we could retrain our brain to wake up and not have breakfast. And then after a week or so, our body really starts getting in that zone and, you know, start, starts building that routine to where all of a sudden at nine, 10 o'clock, you'll be fasted, feeling more mentally sharp than you probably have since you were a kid. Yeah. And I know a lot of services have been born out of this, this need and this desire to, um, shorten the amount of time it takes for food preparation, i.e. they're cutting out 
you're having to go to the grocery store. So you can receive everything you want in a box shipped to you. And, and from what I've seen, Will, these services source their food really well. Do you have any input on, or experience with any of the food delivery services? Uh, not not pre-cooked food, but the raw stuff that you put together into a meal. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't really personally spent the money to you know, have it delivered to- Yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> But, but it, I mean, it sounds like an awesome, convenient thing. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't have the extra resources at the moment, you know? But I think if they're sourcing it from quality foods, like, yo, that's great, you know? And there's a lot of companies out there that I have messed around with a bit that actually have pre-made foods that are really healthy and really uh, delicious. You know, I don't think they're the top, top, top best, but they're okay, you know what I mean? Um, but what I think is the coolest aspect is a lot of our local organic farms have delivery. You know, a lot of the CSAs that you join will deliver it right to your front door. And why I'm so at, like advocate about joining that CSA and joining that local farm is the more people who join that local farm, the more resources they'll have to deliver. You know, the more resources they'll have to give you that higher quality food. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know you'll be proud, Will. I found my local CSA. It's about an hour away and they deliver here to my hometown once a week or, or wow. with the window of opportunity for pickup. So they I'm actually are, really surprised that it's an hour away. You know, that, yeah, I, I was too. And it's the far. only one. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and, and we only have one organic farm in our county as well. But, but then again, what we pay for tells them what we want, you know? So if we start sourcing our food from higher quality local places, we're going to start, it's going to start popping up more and more to where then eventually it's going to be 30 minutes away, you know, because they're tracking what we're spending our money on, you know, and we have to bring our food back to local industrial agriculture, industrial farming of just thousands of acres of monocrops, it's not only killing us, it's not only giving us all of these heart diseases, lung diseases, um, diabetes, but it's killing our planet, you know, like that's a huge cause of our climate change. That's a huge cause of our natural disasters. And not to mention most of our farmland, all of those toxic chemicals are running down that Mississippi River. And, you know, the, we have spikes of autism. We have spikes of all of these illnesses in our children, in our children. Like that's something to wake us up to realize like, look, this is not just to eat healthy just so we have good looking six packs. You know, like if this is about our children, this is about our future. Like we have to be making the best decisions ourselves so our kids learn, you know? So, so our kids have trees when they grow up. So our kids have an ocean. So our kids can eat high quality foods, but that's why it, it, it's, it's more important now than ever to source our foods from sustainable practices, from not only sustainable agriculture, but regenerative agriculture, you know, and it's so, so important because we have really done a number on our soils. We've really done a number on our earth to where we see it in our health. We see it when, when we walk outside and, you know, we see you know, the toxic roads and how people are going crazy. When people are healthy, they tend to be really happy. You know, when people are sick is when they feel like they need that survival, they're fighting for their life, and they're fighting everyone around them. That's one of the biggest, actually, things that I've noticed in my diet and, you know, in my experiences, when I'm eating toxic food that is toxic to my body and my body is constantly having to fight off toxins, I notice that I'm fighting my environment more. I notice I'm getting into more arguments. I know I'm disagreeing more. I notice that I'm more, um, I'm more likely to judge somebody. I'm more likely to have a problem with what somebody else is doing when my body is constantly fighting. You know, it, it, it becomes really interesting that what we see and what we perceive in our environment tends to be a mirror of what's going on inside. So if we're eating happy, healthy foods, you know, nourishing foods, we tend to 
guess what? Nourish our environment. When we're taken care of in our gut and in our health, then we're healthy enough to nourish our friends, to nourish our family with, you know, our insights or with our knowledge or with our just ability to serve, you know? And what I've noticed is the people who fight people the most, who argue with people the most, their diets are doing the same thing inside their gut health. Yeah, so the next time you send me that snarky text message telling me to get something done by a particular time and you're not very nice about it, I'm going to ask you, what the hell did you eat this week, Will? You know, and, 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 and it's really, really powerful because it's true. Most likely, like our gut health is one of the biggest determining factors of how we're going to feel mentally. I promise you, like if you are struggling with mood swings, if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, you know, especially, you know, anxiety, you can almost take real quick control of by changing your breathing patterns. You know, he talked about that all last month, but if it's chronic anxiety to where it's almost depression or real a depression, check your diet, immediately check your diet because just to improve your gut health will start making you feel a little bit better. You know, every different fruit and vegetable tends to nourish and support a different function in our body. And if our heart is pumping a little bit better, our kidneys are de detoxifying and cleaning a little bit better, our lungs are working good, our blood flow is, you know, just optimal, we're going to feel better mentally it becomes really hard to feel bad mentally when we're feeling really good physically, you know? So when we can take care of our gut health, watch how it improves your health. If you're fighting with your husband, if you're fighting with your wife, if you're fighting with your kids all the time, try cooking a healthy meal and sitting down and loving each other and taking care of each other and nourishing each other while nourishing yourself and watch how the next day can just go a little bit smoother with a little bit less arguments. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. This goes to science. Yeah, I appreciate that, Will. And, and what a great strategy. If you're, if you're stressed or anxious about the time it takes to prepare a meal, prepare it with your family, prepare it with your loved ones, and make it a, an event rather than a process to satisfy hunger. If you put some meaning and emotion behind it, you know, cooking could be fun and something you look forward to rather than, than, a, than, a, than an anchor holding you back. Yeah, you know, and, you know, and I really love that you mentioned that, Edwin, because the best things that you could do for your kids is to cook with them. You know, show them how to cook, show them how you prepare your food, show them why you're picking a carrot, show them why you're picking a broccoli, show them why you're not just having chocolate, you know what I mean? Not because, you, you, you know, because it is bad, you know, because it does develop an addiction. We want to be able to explain that we want to be con in control over what we think, feel, and do. And a lot of that is taking time to have quality food and have quality nourishment and have quality com quality communion with the people that you care about. Yeah, great point. So uh, again, s staying on this topic of quality, help me with a with the CSA because I haven't read the membership form or the membership packet fully yet, but it's my understanding that I am buying a portion of the harvest and that's what I'm going to pick up on the pickup day whenever everything's ready. So from a reception standpoint, that seems like it could be a lot of food. How do you store, how do you in particular, when you, when you buy part of a harvest, how do you store that volume of food? Well, that's why you're getting um, most likely a weekly harvest or a bi-weekly harvest, you know? So you're getting the freshest food picked that day. Most foods, not all foods, but most foods will lose nourishment the longer time it takes from the time that you pick the food from the time that you eat it. That's one of the great benefits of um, joining a CSA is you're not getting, you know, three cartloads of food. You're getting, you know, one bag of food or two bags of food enough to cook with for that week. You know, and one of the biggest benefits is the variety and the diversity of foods. Like you might get a food in there that you've never heard of. So then you gotta look it up. You gotta learn something new with your family. You gotta learn something new for yourself, which is one of the best things that you could do for your brain. First of all, is to learn anything new, is to learn about a new fruit or a new vegetable and to learn a new way to cook something. But one 
of the most important factors for a healthy diet. One, of course, is eating local foods that are not sprayed with a bunch of chemicals and drugs and, you know, antibiotics and stuff. But two is diversity. You want to, you know, broccoli is great, but if you eat it every single day, your body kind of gets tired of it. Just like if you did the same workout every single day, you want a broad range of different fruits and vegetables. And the broader that range is, the broader your range of your gut microbiome will be. And that will broaden your range of sicknesses that you can overcome, broaden your range of illnesses that you're going to be able to fight from. You know, the, like every different fruits and vegetable helps something else. So the more variety you have, the more your body can handle and the more your body can take because it has those extra warriors with extra little specialties, you know? So that's why you're going to get a bag that'll last you a week, you know, that'll last you two weeks and it's going to encourage you to cook, you know, like, and that's a, a super powerful aspect of that CSA is, you know, oh, you know, if I don't eat this food, it's going to go bad. And, you know, so if you do just go keep going out to eat, you're, you know, you're going to let it go to waste, but it's going to encourage you a little bit more to cook with your family, to sit down, to try something new. And that's really what's going to improve your health and your relationships with your family. Excellent. All right, Will, got a question from David. Um, he's saying, I'll add one more event to your list, Edwin. Make at least one meal each week as a special event. That's a great idea. We choose one day where we take the time to prepare a healthy meal as a family. Then we dress up in our Sunday best and celebrate the meal together. That is awesome. Being at home during the pandemic allows us to make this day a special event and one that we celebrate ourselves. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, like I, I would encourage you to try to sit down and eat with your family every single evening, you know, every single evening. And then once a week on Sunday, invite your friends over, you know, you know, invite the closest people to you and have a little bit of a potluck, you know, and then encourage quality organic food, you know, encourage nourishing food. And that's going to be a little bit out of our comfort zone a little bit to where we're going to have to try a little something new. And we're going to learn how to make healthy food delicious. Because I promise you, you can make like some of the best tasting foods I've ever had, minus chocolate, I love chocolate, but some of the best tasting foods I've ever had were some of the most nutritious foods I've ever you know, and, and it, it just takes a little bit of skill. It takes a little bit of practice of learning, you know, how to make something taste really good and how to cook these di different fruits and vegetables. But if once a week you're inviting some of your closest friends and, and, and neighbors over, it's going to encourage you to really cook something good and, you know, let them try something as well. And if someone brings over a, a carrot cake or a chocolate cake, just enjoy it, you know, and minimize it. You know, it's about moderation if it's bad, right? Yeah, uh, we have a, a chef here in town that has a local restaurant called Parish, because um, here in Louisiana we have parishes, not county uh, counties. But he has an amazing restaurant with very unique food choices that come from the deep south, and he won Top Chef. He was on the Food Network's Top Chef channel, and we loved watching him because you know on those type of shows they have a whole pantry of all this amazing looking food. And it, it, the challenge is to come up with a really tasty and creative meal in a very short period of time. So clearly, if there are people and chefs that do this from a competition and an income standpoint, we can certainly learn if we invest in ourselves the, the, that we need to do this for ourselves. We need to learn the skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't have to take over your whole life, you know, like a chef trying to be the best or competing. It doesn't have to take over your whole life, but it absolutely should be a priority. Nothing, almost nothing is more important than your health and your happiness, right? And the more you nourish yourself and the more you nourish the people around you, the happier, the, the happier and healthier you will be. So if you're going for the quick fix or for the quick convenience, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. That is the quickest way to a ordinary or suboptimal life. 
Yeah, good point. Uh, and as my mantra always goes, disrupt your comfort zone. Just yeah. get over it. Go do something different. It's only going to make you better. So, Will, uh, we're going to stop at number 10. Guess what 10 is? And this is this is one for me. And, and when we consume this, we really start making some bad choices. Can you guess what it is? Alcohol. Yes. Wine and alcohol tends to be a barrier for people, uh, particularly, you know, if you're if you're going out to a restaurant and you want a libation or two before dinner, then dinner comes and boy, all bets are off, all rules are gone. There's no takeout container being delivered to the table. It is, it is gluttony. Uh, how do you address alcohol in, in temporal relationship and timing wise to food? Well, I'll drop a fact bomb on you. Just, just to raise your own awareness. You know, I'm not saying to not drink alcohol. You know, I'm not saying to not drink wine. Like it's okay to have some sometimes, but your body takes alcohol as a poison, right? So when you um, eat a bunch of bad food and then drink some alcohol or drink some alcohol and then eat a bunch of bad food, it doesn't matter which one, your body pushes all of that food to the side and say, holy cow, we have a poison in here. I got to take care of that. Okay. So then your body starts trying to process and digest that alcohol because it, it takes priority. And then what happens to the food not digested or not used? It turns right into fat, you know? So if you are drinking and eating at the same time, you are so much more likely to gain fat and to gain just, and eat more, you know? Cause I know my worst meals was when, you know, years ago when I used to go out drinking and partying and then on my way home, from the bar, or from the club, I'd probably stop at McDonald's because I didn't You're care. Crazy hamburger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just wanted something filling and nutritious, and you know. And then I wake up in the morning, and you feel like crap, you know. So, or I, I'm sorry, not filling and nutritious, filling and delicious. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not nutritious, you know, filling and uh, delicious. I just stop and get some fast food, and that's what happens. So it's you know, it goes back to the same thing moderation and if you are drinking i wouldn't recommend eating at the same time so then you'd have to drink less and, and you, you know because if you don't have a full stomach it takes a lot less alcohol to get where you're trying to go so i mean i, I really wouldn't recommend eating a bunch and drinking a bunch at the same time pick pick your poison one or the other yeah Braden's asking a good question is this also true for drinking soda and I, I would argue yes to a degree, because when you look at the ingredients on a can of soda, there are a lot of names on there you cannot necessarily pronounce, and that must be broken down by the body in order to be processed. So is that a, a priority shift as well? Yeah, I mean, soda is a complete poison. Soda is a drug. You know what I mean? Like I've, I drink soda every once in a while too. You know, after a long weekend of racing, you know, and I might stop at somewhere like Chipotle or somewhere, you know, especially when I eat bad food, it's nice just to have a little, you know, something to help digest that, right? But you have to know what it is. You really want to be limiting, you know, one rule that I gave myself when I was like really learning about a nutrition and trying to eat to look as best as I can is I tried to never drink my calories. You know, you don't ever want to drink your calories because you're not really going to get much from it. You know, it's not going to be quality you know, calories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not going to be nourishing calories in any way, you know, but even the sugar free soda, it's still poison. You know, honestly, don't feed that to your kids. Don't feed that to you want to think of a can of soda like alcohol. It's something you probably shouldn't do every day. You, you shouldn't wake up and have, you know, a glass of whiskey, just like you shouldn't wake up and have a glass of Coca-Cola. Or an energy drink first thing yeah. in the morning to get yeah. you started. Yeah, it's not the right way to go. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, a few times a year to have, you know, a, a night with your long lost friends, you know, having a few drinks or having a few sodas, you know, but just know that that's a drug, you know, there's no different. And, you know, that sugar buzz that you're getting and that dopamine rush that you're getting than any other toxic drug or bad thing you can do. Yeah. 
Uh, David's asking a great question. I've always heard that one glass of red wine per day is beneficial. Is that correct? I've got an answer for that, Will, uh, but I'll let you stab at that first and see if we agree. I think so. Yeah. You know, like, like I think it, if you are to pick your poison, wine is the best way to go, you know, because there are a lot of nutrients in wine that help um, open up your blood vessels, you know, um, and help blood flow and help to relax, you know, one glass of wine, I don't think it's going to hurt you. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I, I, I've also read a lot of places where it is very beneficial. You just got to be careful because it's very high in sugar. So once you start getting the two to three to four glasses of wine, there can be a real issue. Also, um, be careful and mindful, like always, of the quality, because most of the wine that you're getting from California is loaded with pesticides. You know, um, most of the wine that you can get from France or Italy, not so much pesticides, <laughs> you know, so try to get an organic wine, you know, and I know there's a lot of cool companies out there that have organic wine of where they're um, farming their grapes regeneratively. They're farming their grapes sustainably. And it, it goes back to the same thing. If you're buying that bottle of wine sourced from a place that is not taking good care of their grapes, that's not taking good care of their soil, that wine is not going to take good care of you. You know, that you know, that chain works itself all the way down. If you have a really mindful farmer that is taking this ultimate care of these plants and ultimate care of his soil and ultimate care of every process, like an organic wine um, grower does, that wine is going to be much more beneficial for you as well. Yeah. Um, wow, David, th this is a big topic, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. But we have tried to understand the health benefits of certain diets from certain uh, geographic regions of the country, or really the world, where people tend to live longer. So you've heard of the Mediterranean diet. Well, also associated with the Mediterranean diet is an alcohol um, component to that diet. So it's really hard to break out when you have a, a complex diet like that with a, a lot of different food groups, um, a lot of different ages, and you throw alcohol in there. It's hard to pull out, well, was this an alcohol effect or was it something else? So studies are hard. It's hard for studies to pull that out when you're looking at, well, th those are called epi epidemiological studies where you take a lot of information and then you try to make sense of the data and suggest a compass point in some direction that, oh, this looks, this kind of of diet tends to increase longevity, but we don't know which individual component. With wine, however, we've, we've really looked at a lot of components, just like we've looked at a lot of components in tobacco leaves, for instance. I know the cigarette industry has been hammered, uh, and rightly so, for, for the manipulation of the market with nicotine, but there are also some vital components in tobacco leaves that are being studied to treat cancer. So probably the biggest red wine component that they've looked at, uh, particularly for its impact on the lining of blood vessels, and I think that's, that's where the idea of a glass of red wine a day might have some benefit, it's cardiovascular benefit. Uh, resveratrol, which I think is one of the active components in red wine, tends to have beneficial stabilizing effects to the lining of, of blood vessels. How much red wine, what quality of wine, you know, they even, we don't know. And also they've even got pills now of just uh, desiccated wine or, you know, take all the alcohol out and just eat powdered wine. Uh, in hopes of getting a higher concentration of resveratrol, we, we don't know the dose of resveratrol that really makes the difference. So I will, I will end this uh, speech by simply saying there's something in there. There's something about the lifestyle associated with the people who drink it um, that, that all come together to create a picture of health. Yeah, 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 for sure. And like a lot of times it's not necessarily the wine that's bad is not necessarily, you know, you know, the stuff that's bad, but it's, you know, the stuff that comes with it, you know, um, like say a lot of wine, especially in America is loaded with pesticides, you know, like a lot of, you know, the mixed drinks are loaded with sugar. You know what I mean? Like, like, 
it, it, it all comes down to the moderation and just being aware and knowing what it is and what you're trying to do. And I think the more that we can go back to what is natural, it'll naturally take care of itself. You know, like, like it's not natural for somebody um, in the Midwest to eat a Mediterranean diet. You know what I mean? Like, like go back to what's natural and what the earth is already giving you and what makes sense from all around you. And I think your body is really good and really resilient at taking care of itself, you know? So like, know what are the foods that grow abundantly in your area? And most likely that's going to provide you the nutrients that help you thrive in your area. Like, I, you know, I've said a few times before, but I probably can't say it enough is food is just information to our DNA, right? Food is information from our, of our environment of telling our DNA and our body of how to act and what to do and what genes to turn on and what genes to turn off. So that's why it's important that we want to be taking in good information instead of toxic information, you know, because if we take sick and stressed animals, or if we take, you know, chemically stressed food, it's going to tell our DNA, it's going to tell our microbiome, it's going to tell all that in our body that we got to fight for our lives and battle and sick and stress and, you know, fight everything around us as opposed to just eating what naturally grows in your area, you tend to be a lot more connected to your area. You, you, you tend to be a lot more connected to yourself and connected to your environment. Good points, Will. All right, Will, let's land this plane. We've probably got one wow, more wow. webinar that, that to finish out these obstacles. I've probably got four or five more obstacles I want to throw at you. So we'll address those on the next webinar. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Thank you for watching later on YouTube. Drop comments below. Let us know some future topics that you want us to go over. Um, let us know your favorite healthy foods. So if you're watching this right now, put in the comments below on YouTube, later on, right now, wherever. Tell us your favorite foods that you eat that are healthy, because I think that's important. One of the best and easiest ways to start improving your diet is to know the healthy foods that are healthy that you like already, you know? Um, so yeah, and again, if you want to join in on these conversations, go over to chatwithwillgrant.com and reserve your spot because we're at these pretty much every single week. And also I got a bunch of new updates and some really cool things on my website as well. So don't forget to check that out at www.thewillgrant.com. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Thank you, David, for that comment. David was saying great show today. We appreciate that. And until next time, I'm Edwin Adams with DisruptComfort.com and my friend, Will Grant. Thanks for being here. All right, later guys. See you next week.